parts understand each other. I've watched the greatest college players ever play at the Garden, the old Garden. Watch the ABA from its inception. Watch the NBA for now, you know, since the 50s. I've seen them all. Uh, I've seen them all in the playground. Jackie Ryan is one of the best shooters I've ever seen in my life. Bar none. Jackie Ryan is one of the biggest wastes of talent in, in the history of basketball. All the walls are bare Far from my lair Far from nowhere Far from nowhere play ball, you can't hang. It's as simple as that. Basketball is the coolest shit you can do in New York. For people who grew up in New York where there's over 500 courts, over 75 playground tournaments in the summer, I mean, this is Mecca. New York is Mecca, and Jack grew up in that Mecca. And Jack has made a name for himself in the Mecca of the street. New York City in particular, uh, there's been a romance to playground basketball over the years. Where quarters are cramped, you don't need a lot of equipment. It's full of surprises, that's what city life is. I saw people get stabbed. Amalams will come, take them to the hospital. We get right back on the court, start playing ball again. Then you see another fight break out. People you know, try to break up the fight, people will run home, gunshots come, people will clear the park for about 10, 15 minutes. The crowd right back out there playing basketball again. It was all about winning. And when you win any kind of way, I mean, if it came down to it, you know, collectively, if you had to cheat or whatever, you just wanted to win. Because if you lost, it was going to be a long wait to get back on that court. You can play high school ball for four years. You can play college ball for four years. You can play pro ball for maybe 10, 12 years. They're all finite experiences. Playing on a playground is infinite. And if you don't succeed, you sort of enter the the oral history of someone who didn't quite make it, a could have been, a has been, whatever it might be. And there's a kind of stature to that too, in a, in a tragic way. Some of the players, guys like Joe Hammond and Herman the Helicopter Knowings, these guys, you almost have the sense that they played for a place in that tragic history. It was a good neighborhood. Good neighborhood to raise children and uh, grow up in. Middle class, mostly, you know, uh, civil service, cops, firemen, construction workers like myself. Hard working people. I wouldn't have wanted to have been raised anywhere else. You walked out your door and there was, you know, 100 kids on the block playing whatever game and it was very competitive. Obviously with that many kids you had to if you didn't stand up for yourself and, and hold your own, you weren't going to be in the games. You couldn't be a meek person and live in that neighborhood, you know, because you would get trampled on. Because of Brooklyn, because of the social dynamic that all of us grow up with, the minefield we have to navigate just to exist, it, it robs a lot of these kids of their innate ability to believe in themselves. You have to be somewhat street smart, aggressive. Growing up in the park, you're always playing against older guys. You know, you get beat up on, and you get, and it makes you tougher.
His father was a football nut. His father was a, a football maniac, and, and um, he was the driving force behind Jack's early football career. He was consumed by football, and Jack was a great football player. He wanted to kind of have Jack follow in his footsteps. Jack was a tremendous quarterback. He had a humongous room full of trophies, just wall-to-wall -wall Nothing. It was like a trophy room. When I was 12 years old, I flipped out of a tree, and I landed on my right wrist, and I broke my wrist in three places. And I couldn't throw the football anymore. I wasn't the best anymore. I didn't have the accuracy. I couldn't throw it as far. So I wasn't that good anymore. I didn't want to play anymore. It was the beginning of another football season. I was 13. And he said, if you want to play, you know, let me know. I'll put up the money. If you don't want to play, let me know right now. But I'm warning you, if I put up the money, you're finishing out the year. It's like, okay, dad, all right, I'll play, I'll play. Now, I'm not even starting. You know, I'm the second string quarterback. So it's, it's no fun for me. I don't want to play. So one, Summer day in August, you know, it's 90 degrees. All my friends are around the park. I had to come back around and get ready for practice. And I came back around and I was telling my mom, Mom, I don't want to play football anymore. I don't, I don't want to play no more. I don't want to play no more. She said, well, you have to go tell your father. My dad knew it was coming. I remember he was looking at me like, go ahead, tell me. So I was like, Dad, I don't want to play anymore. I don't want to go. I don't want to play anymore. Whack. That was the end of my football career. I mean, we ran out of there, you know, went back to the park where he felt safe, you know. The park actually was a safe haven for Jack. Now it was all about basketball. I played basketball every day, four, five, six hours. I'd ride my bike to Manhattan Beach, play basketball all day there, come home, have iced tea and cookies, and then go back around the park, get ready for 5 o'clock, 5.30, when everybody came to the park and play. Sometimes at night, you know, 2, 3 in the morning, I'd sneak out my back window, jump off this little deck, go through the other yard, and I'd come out right into the park. I had to cross the street. And I'd play basketball there for a couple hours just by myself, dribbling, going crazy up and down, and then, you know, go back home the same, same way I got in. Yeah, it didn't matter if it was raining, snowing, you know, if it was the summer, fall, winter. If there was an inch on the ground, or if there was 20 inches on the ground, I would shovel till it was all clear, and then we would play. The, the park was everything. The park was everything. I had holes in my sneakers, like this, on both sides, and I used to put cardboard in them so they would last a little longer. I would go to my dad and show him my sneakers, like, Dad, you know, I need sneakers for basketball. And he'd tell me, go get a job. You know, If I told him when I was playing football, Dad, I don't like these cleats, I want a different color, I want a new pair of shoulder pads, I want a new helmet, can you buy me a football? No problem. I need a pair of sneakers because my hole is this big and the cardboard is wearing out. Go get a job. I was a class clown, always got in trouble. I wound up getting 23 demerits. I failed four subjects and I got suspended or kicked out of class for making other people laugh. He was the class clown who happened to have basketball talent. If the three-point shot were in effect, he probably would have averaged between 35 and 40 points a game. In his senior year, he was probably, again, not to be ethnic, but probably the best white ball player in America. Louis Conaseca came down to scout him, and he sat between me and my other brother, Randy, and he had 48 points that game. And Louis Conaseca said it was, he says, that is an, the nicest shooting touch I've seen in a long time. As you will follow the schools in your conference, as you know, you get to hear about how guys are doing, and for John Jay, Jackie Ryan, Jackie Ryan, Jackie Ryan. He was the star of a not good team, so he shone even brighter. And probably let him get away with more than I should. In those years, dunking in warm-ups was illegal. It was a technical foul, knowing that he shouldn't do it. You turn your back, and then the ref is walking over to the coach. He's 
hanging on the rim. In those days, everybody then dunked like today, you know, and that was to see a white boy dunk was even more exciting. He was a show off, he was an entertainer. The more and more praise I got from being a good ball player, it made me feel like I was on top of the world. And I wanted to be better and better. We never lost a home game. So any team coming into Boys and Girls High, they were in for a dog fight. Jack, myself, and his coach were the only three white guys in the gym. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. You know, the court was straight up and down. It had girders, you know, pillars holding the roof up. And they were right on top of everything. And he went on and we were up 12-2. The place was going berserk. Jack is already in his mid-40s, a 40-point game going on. About a minute to go, the crowd is going crazy. Jack's at the free throw line and somebody said something. Jack just like pulled his pants down and got thrown out. A riot broke out and we had a 450 game. The whole time I was there, we had four Division I scholarship players. This was gonna be the fifth. At the time, I was the head basketball coach at Ohio University, and Pete Coakley called me up and told me all about Jack. And the first time I saw him, I, I, I was just amazed. He's one of the best white players I'd ever seen. I was going to put my life into him because I really thought he had a chance. Jackie's dad's mentality was, you know, he was a he was a dock worker, and you know, the docks are good enough for me; they're good enough for my sons. So education wasn't really given a premium, and using his basketball skills to get an education wasn't really a premium. I signed a letter of intent to go to Ohio University on a four-year basketball scholarship, Division I school. I was there for a whole weekend. I loved it. I couldn't wait to go there. I could see, for the first time in years, my dad was happy with me. He was really happy with me. I got a call two weeks after that. Uh, from one of the coaches saying, Jack, you can't come here. You can't come to Ohio University. You have a 1.9 average. When I got that call, it really took all the air out of me. We had him ready to go to Ohio University. Just academically, we just couldn't get it done. So then we set up a deal for him to go to Lorraine Junior College in Lorraine, Ohio. You get your grades up, then you can come back to Ohio University the following year. Like, OK. It was the first time I was away from home. I started drinking. Girls all over the place loved me. I just went nuts. Mentally, he just wasn't together. Mentally, he was a mess. Jack was an asshole. <laughs> Excuse me. Coach said, do this. Jack still in his clown mode and everything, and they let him go. When I first got to Oregon, man, I remember walking to different classrooms and people were like, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? And I was like looking around, I was like, I know they didn't know me because I'm from Brooklyn and I've been on campus for a couple of days, but it was just the, the way of life out there. Everybody was so friendly, you know. First time I got on the court and I'm playing with these guys and I just blew by everybody. I was quicker than everybody. I didn't miss. I played great. I was like, I'm going to kick ass at this college. In the beginning, it started off good. I thought I was playing in the coach's system. By the middle of the year, he really wasn't digging me. I don't know if it was for stuff I was doing off the court. Coach tells him, don't ride your bike in the gym. He gets caught riding the bike in the gym. Don't do it again. He does it again. Things started going downhill where I know he wasn't happy with me. If I dribbled the ball through my legs, I was out. If I did anything fancy, I was out. I could see how much talent he had, and I could see that uh, he just, you know, he, he didn't care. You know, I came into practice drunk on Saturday mornings. I'm sure he could smell it on me. His wild social life that took place at night uh, ended up being a problem. I started drinking more, started acting more crazy. Now I was pissed off. 
because honestly, I feel that I could have been on that court and I could have scored 30 points a game easily. The season's over, I just stopped going to school. And uh, sometime in June when my girlfriend at the time, Susie, when, when she was done with school, we, we drove back to New York. Went to see him play, automatically I liked his play. He was a gusty kite kid, he took chances, flashy, quick, nasty, good, strong, nasty attitude, uh, didn't care much about you. Look, I'm, I'm gonna bust you up just like you're gonna try to bust me up. Jackie was so talented. Um, you might have heard that white men can't jump, but there's a difference. He's not 6'3", he's not 6'2", he was 5'8" and he was dunking the ball. And now Brooklyn was Division One for like a heartbeat. Mark Ryan, a blonde hair, big time player and coach, you know, he's gonna bring Brooklyn back to the promised land, we're going to the NCAAs. Enter Jack Ryan. Everyone in Brooklyn, when you heard Jack was going to Brooklyn, saying, they're gonna do it, man. I'm going to see the games, man. I don't care if that gym sucks, I don't care how small it is, it's a show. First year that we were there, Mark Reiner made it a point to play everybody, all the powerhouses in the country. Here was an, uh, uh, an opportune time for Jack to shine. Mark Reiner was a sticker for discipline, straight up. You know, he expected you to carry yourself a certain way, dress a certain way. Here's this guy, comes in, and basically had a hood attitude. Second or third game into the season, Jack had his opportunity to start as the point guard. We're playing against Navy. David Robinson was a freshman. And I was playing against this little point guard. I remember his name, Willie Jett. He was about five foot eight, lightning. Mark Ryan always told him, play within your game. I don't want anything flashy or anything like that. Jack started getting into this little role. He dropped a couple of jump shots from all over and started taking it to the hole. He had probably, I would estimate, you know, 15 points already at the half, you know, against a very good Navy team. I remember driving to the baseline and I went to take a, a jump shot and Willie was there and he kind of hit me and turned me a little bit, so I just let it go. I did a full 360 on the baseline and I was shooting the basketball. Before he can come down, Mark Reiner already had me off the bench going in. And after the game, he just ripped me apart. You know, how can I embarrass him like that by doing that 360 move? And that's it, you're gone. I'm done with school. School is not for me. Coaches are not for me. I'm going to go back. I'm going to be the king in the park. West Forsyth was one of the first places that had a reputation as a playground basketball court. West Forsyth Street is kind of the front porch of New York playground basketball because it's it's right there by a subway stop and it's it's a neighborhood that's frequented by all New Yorkers. I've been here almost 30 years, director 27 years. Some of the greatest basketball players in the city have come through this court. came here, you watched for about a month or two or three before you even were let on court. I think what's great about West 4th Street is how cramped it is. Um, and it's a real cage. It's surrounded by chain link on all sides. And if you throw a behind the back pass or you go between your legs, no one's going to yank you out of the game. In fact, just the opposite. There are going to be people clinging to the chain link fence who are going to go crazy if you pull the move off. You have to cut your teeth here. One way or the other, even if you don't right, get one, you have to. If you consider yourself a ball player, you have to have a West 4th Street t-shirt from a team that you played on. We look at him like he's six feet tall, he's a white boy. We don't think he's tough, but with Jack Ryan, he could dribble just like somebody black, like he came out the hood. And then he shoots the ball exceptionally well. I met Jack in 84. Right away, we adopted him. I mean, you can see he a white guy, but we call him Soul Man. We call him Super Jack. Here comes a little white guy, bang, 
15 in the face. Now shut up. A player is a player. You know, once you get between the line, all that other social stuff, throw it out the window. I would say he's the only white boy other than Chris Mullen that has the type of respect universally from borough to borough. Everybody watches the N1, you know, mixtapes these days. And everybody can do, put it around the guy's back and through his legs and stuff like that. Jackie was doing that when I first met him, you know, 20 something years ago. And he was white back then also. He loves getting to laugh. He loves getting that little moment of fancy, creative, ah, that ooh. He could dunk up, you know, to his elbow, and he was only like, you know, Jack is only 5'9 or so, 5'10 maybe. Scary, you know, the kid was scary. Here, you play for the crowd. The crowd gets into it. You know, that's what I love. I love coming down, hitting my shots. Do something good, you hit a fence dart around. I'm on the sidelines, I'm waiting to play, you know, and Jackie's on the court, and he gets the ball like on the right baseline. Three guys about 6'7 come over and they're ready to block it. Jackie goes up, goes up, goes up, he hangs on the support. He just puff dunk. You know, it's like, I swear to you, I sometimes dream about this to this day. He's put on some shooting exhibitions like I've never seen before. He, uh, he's one of the best shooters I've ever seen. His balance is perfect, like a fighter throwing a left-right combination. His form and his release. It's a beautiful thing, man. It's almost orgasmic. <laughs> I saw Jack play in West 4th. I saw Jack drop like 50 at the half. Drop 50 at the half and just was walking around taking his teeth out, showing everybody that his teeth were dead. That was the funniest moment I ever saw a guy. And he didn't even, he didn't even try that hard. Basket, what time is it? Whack! <laughs> what time is it? <laughs> at that point in my life, I worked to have enough money for beer and for sneakers for basketball. It was cowboy boot era. He had his like fringe on, he had the boots, the tight black jeans. In comes Jackie, rock star style. Two females behind him, rock, what up? I said, one for me, he goes, not likely. <laughs> you know what I mean? Comes over and he like asks me to dance. Now no one is dancing in this place. It's like karaoke night or something. Jackie was a long haired, mustachioed, you know, porno star playing basketball with the tightest shorts you can imagine, with the biggest Irish ass just popping out from out of his shorts, and just jump shooting like a madman. He worked for me for about four or five years. One of the kind of guys that you never know if he was gonna to come to work or not. And if he did, it was always two, three hours late, or two, three hours early. And I loved it at first because I started to work at 3 or 4 in the morning. I was home by 9 in the morning. I could lay in the pool or go to the beach, you know, when it was nice out. Then I slept in the afternoon, then I woke up to play basketball. It was good that he had a steady job, and it was good that he was making money. But uh, he was out of his mind. One of the good things about being to work at 3 or 4 in the morning is you can go out and hang out all night, and hit the clubs, hit the bars. I'd be out all the time. He would go into this go-go joint and they started to get to know him a little bit. Jackie was the only guy I think I ever saw that was able to jump up on stage and dance with the girls. I mean, literally take off everything, start dancing with the girls up on stage, and the bouncers and the owners loved it. When I drank, I wanted to have fun. I wanted to make people laugh. I wanted to act crazy. I wanted to score on every girl. In my early 20s, I used to play at the 14th Street Y with Pete Vesey. He said, Jack, I think you're better than a lot of guys in the NBA. I could probably get you a tryout. And I said, I didn't want it. Jack is the only guy in my life who was better than he thought he was. But he was out of his mind then. I mean, he just was, it was, there was no responsibility in his life. He was, you know, on his bike, he was drinking, he'd get drunk. He wouldn't sleep, he'd go right to work drunk. I knew other people looked at me in the way that, you know, Jack Ryan, guy don't work, he's a bum. He lives, lives off the fruits of the land. He don't give a shit, you know? But I know playing basketball and being 
a great basketball. That made me feel okay. That made me feel like, well, you know what? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a career. I don't have a job like all these other guys, but I'm better than all these guys. I'll bust their ass. He really knew what he was capable of, and he had this image of himself that he was totally, totally unstoppable. He was a very emotional player. He was a very volatile player, and um, most guys, if they got a bad call from an official, um, would complain, um, maybe even yell, maybe even curse, and uh, get a technical foul. Jack would have a tendency of pulling his clothes off. He'd just go, motherfucker, don't fucking foul me again. He'd just, he'd rip his, he'd rip his clothes off. Cocksucker. Hey man, that's good defense. It's nothing intentional. Defense? Suck this cock, you motherfucker. Good defense, my ass. Let's go. You gotta, yeah. you gotta yeah. let a guy land. Yeah. You gotta yeah. let a guy Let's land. see what happens now. You wanna fuck around and try to hurt me? And guys would be like, he, I saw him. He would grab his shorts and rip his shorts all the way up and rip his shorts off his body. He'd end up being in just in his tidy whities I swear to God, I've seen him do that a hundred times. If he blew a play, he'd try to rip his claws off, he'd try to rip the hair out of his head. He'd kick the ball, you know, into the ceiling, into the lights. He'd have a temper tantrum. The guy was a walking temper tantrum. You were fucking that much away all the time, getting into fights and fucking arguments and heated. And, you know, and it, and, it, and it stopped being about playing ball and, and getting a sweat. And it started, you know, it was just being, I'm right, I'm better. You fucking cocksucker. We ended up finding that less and less people wanted to play with us. does not tolerate imperfection in himself. That's, that doesn't cut it with him. And that, I think that's it's part, of, part of his problem. He fell into a rut and he had a couple of girlfriends who he didn't treat well. When I had a girlfriend and I drank, in the beginning it was great. But when we fell in love and we were together for a while. I know with all my girlfriends, when I drank, then I changed, I became a different person. I couldn't even enjoy myself because I had to watch him. And it just got to the point where I was just like, I don't want this. And if you can't, if this is what you want, I, I can't be here to support you and because and, this is not fun for me. I was miserable. She, I was getting more and more drunk and I didn't have any money. I had my mom helping me pay the rent. I, I left, I left, I couldn't take it. He was the happy-go-lucky guy, but it was just a front for what was really going on on the inside, which came out when he drank or when you opposed him in some way. And this particular night, I stroked him the wrong way or he was on one of his little tangents or one of his fits, and I decided to leave the bar. The next thing I know, Jackie is banging on my door ordering me to let him in. And when I let him in, when I tell you, it didn't even look like him. He looked like a different person. He would get this rage in his eyes. And I was like, oh my God, what's gonna happen? I really had enough. And I snapped and I punched him right in the face. And I knew that at that point, that it was going to be an all-out war. It, you couldn't do anything to him, to oppose him, because he was going to do it tenfold. You didn't fuck with him, period. At this point, you know, Jack's mom, who was just the nicest woman in the world. She was never done with Jackie. She always believed in him, but she was so hurt by what he did and DUIs and getting arrested and not going to court dates and warrants were issued for his arrest. And, you know, and he's basically hiding out and still driving around, didn't care, didn't give a shit. But his father wasn't brokenhearted. His father was pissed off and he wanted to strangle Jackie. And there were a couple of like really bad confrontations that they had. He finally told Jackie, stay the fuck out. Don't come back here. Nothing at that point was going right, and I was just, 
I was basically dead. He was constantly trying to get past the fact that he was still a fuck up. His dad always called him a fuck up. Uh, we always called him a fuck up because he was, you know? And so he couldn't get past that. It was like a psychological block. I could be great, but you know what? That, that, that greatness is for someone else, it's not for me. It was drilled into him at an early age that he was a fuck up. And he, and he believed it, number one, and he accepted it. There was certainly a point where I think everyone was close to giving up on Jackie. The only thing I could do right in my 20s was play basketball. Jackie was in the category of uh, the Pee Wee Kirklands and the Joe Hammonds and the Earl Manigault. Jackie could shoot with all of them. Most of the great shooters, Reggie Miller, all those guys, they can't create their own shot. Jackie could create his own shot. Other players come up to me saying, you're wasting your talent, you should be playing somewhere. So I saw Pete at the Y. I said, Jackie, you know, why not, why not one more shot, one shot, one legit shot? You know, can you get yourself in shape or get your tryout with the Nets? Pete had asked for a favor uh, for Bill to take Jackie into camp because uh, he felt that, uh, you know, Jackie was a guy that had NBA ability and that been this New York playground legend, but had never really had his shot. I think you got to be seen by the right people and quite frankly it takes a little bit of luck. You know, you got to be seen at the right place at the right time. For him this was, um, this was an opportunity of a lifetime. Well, of course, you know, you're a little kid, you think NBA, that is the best of the best. And here I am, you know, really no college experience, uh, playground experience, walking into this situation. I'll never forget the day he showed up for, for uh, rookie free agent camp. This guy looked like he was from uh, Southern California off the beach. You know, I was really nervous and everybody was, was huge. Everybody was gigantic. Everybody was really athletic. And Jackie, I thought, did a great job uh, between his first practice and his second or third practice of getting to a point where he was really learning on the fly, but he was finding out what playing in an NBA system was all about. To me, it was just a good pickup game in a park. No, no one can handle the ball like I could, and for sure, no one can shoot like me. And you could tell that he could sense that that moment was, was upon him. So it was the last day of camp. Bill Fitch calls me over. He said, do you ever have a tryout before? I said, no. He said, you ever play in CBA? I said, no. Europe? No. He goes, next year you don't need Pete Vesey. You're invited back here by me. So I was like, great. So even though I got let down, I got cut that day, I felt really good that you know Bill Fitch wanted me back the next year. I go down to Florida to play in this Pro-Am tournament. And uh, there's two teams playing, we're playing next, and I'm just on the side, spinning a basketball on my thumb, not even knowing that somebody's watching me. And somebody came over and said, hey, pretty good with those basketballs. And he goes, I know someone in the uh, Harlem Wizard organization. How'd you like to be a Harlem Wizard? And the first thing I did to him was, I'm white. <laughs> Todd Davis told me that we were going to have a white player on the Harlem Wizards. I was shocked because I didn't know any white players that could really handle the ball and stuff. But with him being a white guy, he was expected to shoot. You know, you're not going to come down the middle and dunk the ball, but you know, being able to knock it down, and he proved himself in that. 24, 
for 26 from the field in the third quarter alone. All three pointers. Obviously he shot the ball well, but he also had other things as far as tricks and stuff like spinning the ball, one of the best that I ever seen. I mean, he took it upon himself to day in, day out, practice different tricks. I practice my tricks like I practice my game when I was a little kid. I practice for hours, two, three, four hours a day, and you know, I, every week I got better. I became the first white showman for the Harlem Wizards, which means I wore the mic and I did the whole show. Thank you very much. I really liked his sense of humor. It was so different than anyone who I'd ever seen do the show. It was no act. It was truly Jack. The New York studios of the WB11. This is the WB11 News at 10. Called the White Michael Jordan, and he's not even in the NBA. Instead, New Yorker Jack Ryan has developed his skills while playing with the Harlem Wizards. Being with the Wizards was great. Playing in the game, everybody's there to see you, everybody's there to see you do your tricks, do your dunks. You know, we have a pregame show, we have our halftime show, and at the end we sign autographs. He kept telling me, come, come watch, come watch. I'm like, Jack, I've been watching you do this shit for 30 years. I don't need to watch you with a basketball. He's not, no, you don't understand. It's not about the basketball, it's about the kids. Come, just come watch. Yeah, we got a high five here, yeah. So I went and I watched. There had to be 200 kids. When it was over, they all, they all ran to him, and he just stood there in the sea of kids. They wanted his autograph. They just wanted to touch him. It really was amazing. I really felt like I was a celebrity, like I was in the NBA. I was, I was something. I think when he realized it's not all about him and that it's not all about taking, that giving can be rewarding as well, that's when things started turning around for him. Well, when I became a wizard, that, that's what did it. That's what changed my whole life. I mean, I owe a lot to the Harlem Wizards because it was everything I was, everything I've done my whole life. You know, I was always a good basketball player and I was a clown. I was a clown my whole life, so it was just like... I've been practicing since I'm eight years old, and I still keep practicing. You want to be a good basketball player? You want to be good at tricks? Jack just builds up the confidence in kids, and once you build up just this much confidence in a kid, it could change a kid, hope or sauna in life. You want to be good at anything in life? Just practice. I've been in the basketball on a little five-year-old, seven-year-old kid's finger. I've seen it go or seeing him say before, he does it, I can't do it, I can't do it. And then I take his finger and do it, and he's like, oh. seeing that, that's a great feeling. I remember one time Jackie came home from a children's charity function, I believe it was for children with cancer, and a nun had come up to him, and she had said, I hope you realize, you know, what you're doing is really terrific. Uh, you're making children happy, you're doing God's work. And Jackie couldn't wait to get on the telephone and tell my mom that. And when she heard that, she beamed. His mom totally was so supportive and she's like, you know, Jack, it's wonderful what you're doing. It's just great. Because she could see how much happiness it brought him. Years preceding uh, September 11th, he would tell me dreams he had of Jennifer and tell me how, you know, Mama came to me in my dream and told me about Jennifer. And I'd say, Jackie, get over it. You know, Jennifer moved on. September 11th, 
Jen called to check on our whole family, knowing how close we lived and worked. And um, Jackie gave her the good news that we were all okay, but uh, he took the opportunity to ask her out for a cup of coffee that day. As soon as I saw him, we both kind of looked and just even didn't even know how to act. I felt like I was in grade school again. When I saw how happy he was with what he was doing, just the fact that he could make money doing something that he loved so much. I just knew that finally he, he kind of found peace within himself. That's when I knew we could possibly make something out of this. We ended up spending more and more time together and then it was, um, you know, fate, I guess, again. It took a tragedy to, you know, bring them together. I hope God didn't give me my daughter for payback for what I did to my girlfriend because I'm going to be really sad when I get older because I, my baby doesn't deserve that. I mean, no one deserves to have someone mean and abusive like that. And uh, I'm just, I'm glad all this came around where I'm doing what I love, I'm successful. I now have self-esteem for the first time in my life, and I have my baby daughter to make me realize that all the people I hurt, and it wasn't just girls, it was guys too, it was friends of mine who I used. Like I, I took everything in, I wanted everything, and I didn't give anything out. Finally growing up, but I know I, I wasn't like that most of my life. I think Jack Ryan, at where he's at right now in his life, is a tremendous success story. Tremendous success story. Why? I mean, the dude makes money, supports his kid, his wife, himself, doing what he loves to do. How much greater can life be? Jackie just knew he could either follow his dream and disappoint his father, or become someone, something he didn't want to and live a miserable life. And I'm glad that he chose what he wanted to do. The circus can't be done without me. So it shouldn't be too hard for you to see. It goes around. I love my dad. I wish he was around. Of course. I know he'd be really, really proud of me. We want to kind of declare stories over and say, okay, well, this is how it ends. Well, it's not going to end for decades for him or for any of us. And, um, uh, but the game's going to continue and there's always going to be kids coming along who need to be influenced, who could learn lessons from people who've gone before them, the things to do, things not to do. Um, and the mere fact that he's decided to devote his life to trying to reach some of these kids, I mean, that really is rather than a place in the NBA. That's probably what we all ought to be aspiring to. Every time you shoot the basketball, there's got to be no doubt in your mind that it's going to go in. Every time I shoot, that's what I think. And, you know, everybody that knew him since 12, now sees him at 45, and says, wow, this guy came full circle. Shit, if Jack can do it, I can do it. And it gives a lot of people hope, you know? Even if I miss, I know the very next time the basketball is going right down the bottom of the net. It was an exciting thing to see this guy who has changed his life, didn't go off the deep end, took something that he was determined to do and do it. He shoots the eye out of basketball too. The truth of the matter is he does what he loves and that's, that's more important than anything else. I mean, somebody said something to me once when I was young. They said, instead of finding a job and learning to love it or trying to love it, find what you love and make that your job. And, and there is nobody that I know that has done that better than him. A kid 
who like almost all the others, all the other basketball dreams that have died, all the playground dreams that have died, he's the one guy who he took his dream to another level. And basketball didn't die for him. When you play good in front of a crowd or in a game, that's something you've played, you've worked at, you've developed your whole life. And it's like you're getting rewarded. And I love getting rewarded. And every time I do get rewarded, it's like it was worth it. It was worth putting all those hours in the park. It was worth shoveling the snow and playing in the rain or, or playing with a sprained ankle or pray, playing with a broken wrist or playing with my finger out to here or playing with my cracked teeth. It was all worth it because of the feeling that I get from this beautiful thing they call a basketball.